to welcome such a collection of distinguished individuals all gathering together to discuss a new topic. It's not a, a cross-disciplinary topic and a topic which probably will grow in the future. And uh, I, one of our hopes is that this will be recognized as the seedling event that uh, led to this new activity. So uh, I particularly want to thank uh, Professor Katie Borner, who has worked tirelessly to make this happen. And uh, I, uh, I think my job now is to turn the floor over to her, because she's going to make a few welcoming, a few introductory remarks. Mm -hmm. Katie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could have my slides, that would be great. Um, I would like to um, thank all the organizers, so Dean Stanley, Bill Roos right there, Paul Trufino, who is going to be our timekeeper, um, benevolent uh, dictator timekeeper, from what I understand, um, and also our sponsors, uh, Microsoft Corporation and Clarivet Analytics, without whom we wouldn't have the travel support for the students here. It is my distinct pleasure to say a few um, opening remarks and also get a, give a setting the stage um, <coughs> opening so that those of you which are not experts in um, modeling and visualizing science technology developments have a, a better understanding of what has been done before and what we are hoping to do in the future. Um, as you see, um, we have a Twitter hashtag, so if you would like to be active on social media, please do so. Uh, we have two days of uh, full programs, uh, a total of four sessions on different topics. And um, I would like to, uh, again, set the stage for these events which are going to be unfolding here. Um, some of you attended a Sackler Colloquium about 14 years ago uh, on modeling uh, knowledge domains. So 14 years ago, many of us actually met here uh, to discuss how we can collectively use um, papers, patents, grants, clinical data sets, um, news data. Back then, there was not much in terms of social media data uh, to help us understand our collective scholarly knowledge, but also technology landscapes and a little bit of education landscapes. And um, out of the discussions we had here at the Beckman Center, and out of the special issues that resulted from those discussions, um, we created um, new methods and approaches and tools to help many different stakeholders have a better understanding of how science and technology has evolved um, up to today. And we also created a community of um, practitioners and researchers in, in industry and in academia and in government, which are now applying these tools to do more data-driven decision-making. However, also over the last 10 years, about 10 years, uh, it became more and more clear that mapping the past and the present is only part of what people really need. I think it's also a need to understand what kind of impact certain types of decisions will have. If I take this job and not the other job, if I um, invest using a certain funding schema into one area of science or using a different type of funding in the same area of science, what will happen? What is the most likely outcome? Um, if I do other types of um, hiring or research priority setting, what is likely to happen? People need um, to be able to anticipate futures and they need to be able to then pick most desirable futures. And so um, today um, I'm very glad that we are going to start um, this discussion here at the academies to um, understand better what kind of models have been designed so far, what did we learn from those models, and how could we use them better in uh, daily decision making. And many of you, I believe, are using models on a daily basis. You might have looked at weather forecasts before coming here. You might be very familiar with epidemic models, and you might even play with some of the AI models that now beat you in chess easily, and um, maybe also in the League of Legends and other gaming environments. And you might realize that some of those models 
are still imperfect, even though massive amounts of infrastructures were built and lots of experts are working on, for instance, weather predictions because they are so important to get right for construction work, for um, when to harvest, for making really important decisions ultimately. So I um, retrieved this particular weather forecast um, on 11.25 and then I went in again yesterday to see how accurate this actually all is. So eight days uh, in between those um, going to a website and seeing what it is. And um, it became better and this is, new, this is a good news for all of us. So instead of having rain, we now will have only partially cloudy. It's um, going to be, be much warmer than we, we were supposed to um, have the weather going on. Humidity is less um, than originally anticipated. So um, I think just like this um, demonstration shows that not all models are always correct 100%. It's going to be the same with um, predictions for science technology developments. And most likely it's 80% of normal science that we can predict and 20% of disruptive science that we cannot predict. And maybe the 20% of disruptive science will have 80% of the impact, but we don't know that yet. So I hope we can find out together. You might also have seen um, predictions of oil depletion over time. This is a map that shows world oil production from 1859 to 2050. So a long-term forecast of what might happen. And this is extremely important to understand for getting us energy resources which are more sustainable. Um, you might be familiar with seismic hazard maps, and this map is also wonderful for showing that just like you have here, some countries which have sensor networks which are very high precision and very densely packed um, into the ground, like for instance in Japan, there are other countries for which we have very, very little data. And similarly in science technology, you will have areas of science which have the resources and the wisdom to have good data resources. And then there are other sciences which have not the means to actually get um, this data exposed to those which would like to analyze and map it. Um, going forward, um, some of you might work on epidemic models. And as you know, um, in former times, epidemics traveled as quickly as one man or woman could walk or ride on a horse or carriage. And they then uh, diffused in waves. Um, first hitting a city on the outer fringes and going to the core of a city and then passing through it, basically. Today, with airport uh, transportation networks, people go from centers of um, urban uh, hubs to other urban cities, and um, the diffusion patterns look very different. So you see them both uh, shown on the top left and on the top right. You might also be aware that uh, seasonal effects, geographical effects, where an epidemic starts, reproductive numbers, and also, of course, interventions, have a huge impact on spreading patterns. And to make the analogy to the spreading of scientific ideas, here also it matters when your paper on speed dating in research comes out. If it is right before Valentine's Day, that will probably have it spread much faster and quicker, as opposed to if you bring it out for Sylvester or New Year's Day, when maybe most people are busy with their families and happily not reading papers. So similarly, geographically, it matters where you inject new ideas and products. And some ideas are more infectious than others, but in general, it's believed that you need to be exposed to an idea two, three times before it actually starts spreading. And there are different interventions. So marketing experts now look for super spreaders, people which have extensive networks and the power to diffuse. And they try to make them like their products. Movie stars, for instance, are perfect for that. But of course, um, in some cases, you don't want certain fake news to spread. So how do you prevent this? And again, I think we can learn a lot from models developed for very different domains for um, the domain in which we are working. Uh, in general, models uh, help make assumptions explicit. Um, this is very, very important because oftentimes I believe I know how it works, you believe you know how it works, but we have never found a way to um, compare notes on this. Uh, they describe the structure and dynamics of systems. Um, they com help communicate and explain these systems, and they suggest possible interventions. Maybe most importantly, they also help you and inspire you to ask <coughs> new questions. 
Um, there are many different types of models and modeling approaches. Um, major parts are listed here, um, and I believe many of you are very familiar with um, these models. Um, keep in mind that many of these models are multi-level and multi-perspective. So there might be a perspective from a network point of view, from a geospatial point, from a temporal point. And of course, there are different model types, and I'm kind of intrigued to ask each one of you if you are working on stochastic models or epidemic models or network models or agent-based models, but I don't think we have time here, but hopefully over time we will learn who is working with what kind of model paradigm. Now, coming over to uh, models of science, technology, and innovation, this is really an attempt to use qualitative and quantitative data, uh, which is now available, to help us understand the structure and dynamics of science and technology, to make predictions with confidence intervals and probabilities, of course, and then to anticipate what might likely happen to um, help us all understand and agree on how these systems actually do work, and then to really pick and implement desirable futures um, so that we have, have an ownership of our future. We are not just surprised by it. Um, and again, these models are developed in many areas of science, and we are here with experts from these different areas of science to um, understand what models already exist and how they can potentially be combined to make something that's more than the sum of parts. In order to um, exemplify some of those models, I'm going to use maps from the uh, Mapping Science exhibit, and actually some of the authors of those maps are here in the audience, so I'm, I'm very honored to have you all here. Um, one of the maps I wanted to feature is by the Institute for the Future. This is a 50-year outlook of science and technology development. There are a number of white cards, there's a lot of explanatory text. This map was created by bringing experts together, young ones, old ones, um, from different areas of science to help um, the Institute of the Future and um, the client who paid for this map understand what is likely to happen. And if you can agree on these major developments, then um, government regulations, industry productization, teaching and research can align, and this is very powerful for making certain developments uh, work out. I won't have time to go into details here, but all these maps are available online, so you're welcome to zoom in and to um, follow up on the uh, references and also on the explanatory text. In another work, we looked at um, evolution of patent um, portfolios of companies, but also of private people, and we looked at slow-growing classes, patent classes, and fast-growing patent classes. And this is something that many are now able to do, thanks to the data sets that are openly available, uh, and thanks to the tools that now exist. And um, ultimately, I think it's very, very important to understand who claims what intellectual space and how quickly are certain areas evolving over time. In another work, we looked at uh, 113 years of physical review, which is a journal in physics, and we plotted it so that you see the different PAX codes um, from uh, bottom, where there are journals with, or journal papers with no um, PAX codes, to um, zero, which is general physics, all the way up to nine. And then you um, map this over time, so you have a time versus topic base map, and then you can overlay predictions of um, potential future Nobel laureates. And I think some of you are interested in potentially being one of those Nobel laureates. So here um, you zoom in and you get to see what papers might actually get you there. And in case um, you are interested to not only see the past, because this is from 2006, this map, but also um, more future uh, developments, um, you have here the most recent uh, predictions by um, um, Clarivet Analytics now, um, on using the web of science to predict um, the next um, citation laureates, as they are called. And in some cases, they are quite accurate. In other cases, it's harder. And so uh, you can see if you know somebody and uh, point them to it, and maybe it will actually come true. The last map I wanted to share is um, one on, that shows uh, feedback cycles and delays in the science system. So here you see a federal government uh, funding uh, chemistry research, foundational research, with $1 billion each year. Um, this is matched by $5 billion in industry funding. Um, 
both together then are used for invention development and technology commercialization, leading to a $10 billion chemical industry operating income. And then via growth in GNP and created jobs, you get $8 billion in taxes to go back to federal government. So you see two feedback cycles going on, which um, ultimately are feeding um, the system with money and of, oftentimes also uh, results and uh, workforce development. You also see underneath um, the uh, timeline from conception to commercialization, which is assumed to be 20 years. And there are three thick reports behind this map explaining exactly how this was uh, calculated. And um, hopefully it would be interesting to also do this for other domains. But in chemistry, you have uh, four to five years for foundational research. You have nine to 11 years for invention development, and you have five or more years for technology commercialization. So these are the delays in the system. So even if you give a lot of money to somebody who has a great idea, there are just certain delays which you won't be able to overcome quickly. Um, this um, map made it originally as the yellow arrow graph, which you see on the right-hand side, to a congressional hearing. And you might imagine what that hearing was all about. Um, I wanted to uh, share with you a vision that I have for the future of modeling and visualizing science technology developments. And um, some of you might have seen this before because we um, attended another meeting last year on modeling science technology and innovation. But what you will see here is a um, setup where just like we have science or so just like we have weather forecasts today where an, a gentleman or a lady explains to you what kind of weather patterns are likely to happen today and tomorrow or over the next 10 days. <laughs> Here you have uh, the lady in red explaining to you um, developments in uh, science and technology. And we um, did a very simple mock-up at Indiana University and so that uh, people get to see how that um, might actually feel like to have somebody explain to you what is happening in science. So let me start this. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of Science Forecast, broadcast directly out of Indiana University here in Bloomington, Indiana. Today, we're taking a look at a map of the world overlaid with global scientific collaboration patterns. Every time two researchers collaborate, it creates a link. The more collaboration between these two researchers, the thicker that link becomes. We can see this density in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Let's take a deeper look into the United States. We can see this densification along the West Coast, a lot of here along the East Coast, we have Chicago, and here we are in Bloomington, Indiana. Let's zoom back out, take a look at activity in Europe. Fueled by the European Union and other funding, many researchers are collaborating across countries and across different disciplines, creating a lot of activity here. Let's take a look at a different data set. This time we're looking at Twitter, still looking at Europe. Each dot is a tweet, and the colors represent different languages. We can see in the Netherlands we have light blue for Dutch, other major urban areas include Paris, London, Madrid, Berlin, a lot of activity in those areas. Our guest in studio today is Johan Bolin. He's using this global Twitter data from you and from me, our friends and family, and people all around the world to predict human behavior. Let's see what he has to say. You can actually look at an individual and see what that individual is experiencing in terms of, of ups or downs in terms of Exactly. Health. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. I mean, that's what this graph shows. It's essentially a user that at one point in time on Twitter publicly announced that they were, had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Right. Then our computers picked that up. We took the Twitter handle, downloaded the, all of the tweets that that individual had submitted to Twitter over the past uh, two or three years. And then our computers went to work looking at every single tweet, looking for indications of uh, a particular psychological mood state that was evinced by the wording of that tweet. And then you can chart that over time. You end up with a timeline like this where you can clearly see that this individual went through episodes where their, their mood was a lot more manic and had much greater variance. And then very silent periods where presumably they might have been more depressed. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe one day there'll be an app for all of this. It might change when and what you tweet. This is a map of science where continents are not America, Europe, Asia. Instead, they're disciplines of science. We have math and physics in purple, medical specialties in red, and social sciences in yellow. You can see the overlap between all these different disciplines, and the push and pull is created when new links are generated between the different disciplines. Let's zoom in now on medical specialties. Just heard our guest Johan Bolin talk about mental disease. 
and it is found in this medical specialties area. Next time on the Science Forecast, we're going to talk about the funding and the research in this area. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us today. So those of you which um, do not only like to see forecasts, but also like to read about um, what we currently know about how to model science, technology, and innovation, there was a recent uh, conference at the National Academy in uh, DC, and uh, the conference reports are now available online, so you're welcome to uh, pick them up there. Uh, the last two minutes I wanted to spend on modeling challenges and uh, opportunities. I think we do still need uh, to overcome quite a number of challenges. Um, there, is, there are challenges regarding the model utility. Oftentimes there are very, very uh, specific and very special models um, that are inspired by one specific need and uh, using one specific data set. Um, usability is a big issue because um, in order to use knowledge that comes out of model predictions, you really want to understand that model deeply. Um, model credibility and validation, very important. Um, extendability and reproducibility. You might have seen that all the presentations from the Sackler Colloquium on reproducibility are now available online. So please um, look at those as well. And also model sharing and retrieval. How do you even find a model that has been done on science technology? So these are um, elements that will be discussed also tomorrow afternoon when we talk about infrastructures and uh, data repositories for modeling science and technology. Um, modeling opportunities, again, there are many. We do now have high quality and high coverage interlinked data sets. Many have worked on this and have spent a lot of time cleaning that data. Uh, we now have uh, cost-effective storage and computation, also some uh, financed kindly by NSF, NIH, and, and others. We have many validated and scalable algorithms that can be used, and we have visualization and animation capabilities that can be used to bring those forecasts to many also general audiences. And this brings me back um, to our uh, morning uh, session here. And I will um, give it back to Jean Stanley, who is going to introduce um, our first um, speaker in this session. Do you want to? Yeah.